Hey everybody, welcome back to the Linux Cast. I'm your host Matt. I'm joined by Tyler. How you doing? But how you doing, Tyler? Doing good. I am the least organized person in the world today, so be prepared for this to be a horrendous episode. So, because I have no clue, absolutely no clue what we're talking about. And so, uh, that that'll be a it'll be a surprise. It'll be good. All right. Um, so this is the Linux Cast. We talk about Linux usually and uh, FOSS related topics and. We always start off the show by talking about what we've done this week in Linux. We haven't seen each other in a couple weeks, so Tyler, mm-hmm. what have you been doing in the last couple weeks in Linux? Uh, live streaming game development. Um, I'm I'm working on a um, a Resident Evil inspired um, little game. It'll be like a 45 minute uh, free game on itch. Um, and yeah, yeah, I've been working on that, live streaming it on Odyssey. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, also have ran into some uh, issues with performance, which has been awesome because I finally know how to fix performance issues, which is great. Um, so, yeah, it, it's been interesting for sure. What you been up to? Oh, cool. I would, before we move on to mine, I just want to say I watched some of your live stream while you're doing that. Like, you... Like, are you using like is that program that you're using is that unity or is that blender um unity and then i have popped into blender to do um a few things like um essentially all i've been using blender for is i'll take um a 3d model like let's say the gun and i'll take that into blender and just render out the gun as like a 2d view and use that for a nice icon that's really all i've been using blender for um but yeah i am using unity for most of it it looked looked very complicated i was like i'm very impressed um (laughs) (laughs) i don't know anything about any of that kind of stuff so it was very cool uh all right so on my end i've been window manager popping again as usual so mm-hmm. I went through and yes, it wasn't yesterday, but it was the day before I decided I was going to go through and try X monad again. I did do it and I've been happy with it for like the last three days. I mean, the issues I've had aside with getting it to capture OBS to capture a window, I don't know what's going on there, but um, other than that, I've been actually fairly happy with it and I've started finally to understand a little bit of Haskell. So I've kind of made it over the hill a little bit in terms of actually being able to use X money again, whether or not I like it or not. Mm, I'm not sure yet. Uh, mm. It's cool. It's, I love the fact that it has key cords. So like Qtile has key, co- key cords and stuff. Um, mm. X monad has those and those are really useful. I really like those. Uh, Cause that's something that you can't do very easily with DWM. You have to use yeah. something like SXHKD in order to do it. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, it's still very easy to get confused in the configuration file. So I'm having a little bit of issues there. Um, but I've also, before that, I was using Qtile for a little bit. And I was having the stupidest issues. Like, for whatever reason, I'd I'd just be merrily going about my day. And all of a sudden, my keyboard would stop working. Like, you know, I was like, <laughs> well, I was like, oh, okay, well, I mean, maybe my keyboard's going bad. So I unplugged the keyboard and plugged in a different keyboard. I got like four keyboards around me. And same problem. And it, after doing a little bit of investigation, it only happens in Qtile. Like, for whatever reason, it will not register. Because the keyboard actually still works. I can still enter a TTY and everything. Uh, but there no key bindings will register at all. It's really, really weird. And I don't know what's going on there. So uh, that got me out of Qtile. And then I installed Herp Slough. Uh, I haven't done much with it yet. But uh, that's another one that I'm going to be taking a look at here pretty soon on the on the channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've heard good things about herbs Um Never checked it out myself. So I will be interested to see that video and, for sure. And you're using GNOME. <laughs> I know. I know. Like, like, you poor bastard. <laughs> like, how, I, like you, you just, I, I just made you, oh, I don't want to use GNOME, but I have to. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's literally my experience. I don't I don't like the devs. I'm not a huge fan of GNOME and why a lot of the cho- choices they make. Why didn't you choose KDE? If you had to use a desktop event, why not KDE? I don't like KDE. It's just personal preference. I don't like it. Oh. I want to use 
you can you, you might also dislike this one. <laughs> oh, I know you're going to dislike this one, but I would prefer to use Elementary OS six, but it's not there out yet. yet. Uh. So. Um, I'm not going to install something that I can't literally update when the official release comes out. Right, so yeah, that, that the upgrade path is stupid. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So. Um, GNOME. Man. I still don't like GNOME, but Pop OS d- d- makes GNOME the the best version of GNOME. Maybe, possibly, probably not. I don't think there is a best version of GNOME. Yeah, but an, that being said, the best the best version of GNOME is probably Mate. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably, probably the way so it is. true all right uh, okay so let's jump into the contact information you can follow us on twitter at the linux cast you can subscribe to the linux cast.org and you can contact us via email at the linux cast at gmail.com uh you can support us on patreon at patreon.com slash linux cast and you can follow uh tyler at uh you prefer odyssey so there is a link mm-hmm. now in the show notes to his odyssey page follow him there he's also on youtube the link for that will be there as well and of course you can like comment and subscribe on this video on youtube at youtube.com slash linuxcast i got that down yeah oh yeah that, <laughs> that, was, that was slick that, that was, was good. much better okay so each mm-hmm. and every week we select two news items and the at least my link here is older because it was from last week, but I think it's still relevant. We could talk about it a little bit. So, Tyler, why don't we do is. yours first? Um, your first. All right. Week. Well, my link is pretty interesting. Um, I I found it just browsing like Linux news, and I just hadn't heard of it. It's Wayless, I believe, is how you're supposed to pronounce it. W e y l u s, but it's just a little neat little program for your Linux install that can just turn your phone or tablet into essentially like a Wacom tablet. Um, and I just thought it was nifty. Um, I'm definitely going to be doing um, like a video on it. Um, I just thought it was, it was interesting um, to read about it because they are, they already have experimental Wayland support, uh, which I thought was probably the only thing that made it all like really relevant for new, you know, Linux users. Um, maybe somebody who's just popped in and is using GNOME uh, or GNOME uh, Ubuntu, uh, like the newest version. They might they might be running Wayland and just don't even know it. So it's interesting that Wayland supports already, you know, being worked on. Um, but yeah, I I just thought this was a nifty little tool for anybody out there who I don't know maybe wants to start doing some graphic design on uh, on their Linux install, but it's not going to shell the money to go get a Wacom tablet. Hey, here's something that just just might pique your interest and just might you know replace a Wacom tablet, M- make it not even necessary to go out and get one. What are the uh, like tablets and phones that it supports? Is like will run on like any like Android tablet or whatever. Um, I, I believe it's Android tablets and phones. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about iOS, um, at all. Um, but yeah, it, it just, I I don't think there's, um, any weird like support issues when it comes to your phone. I think just as long as your phone's, you know, relatively up to date on its Android version, I think you should be able to install it. Um, it does also make a lot of sense, though, if you're going to be using a phone, you probably want to use something like the phone I've got, where it's got, you know, like an actual stylus with it, um, just because I assume that's what you're going to want to be doing is, you know, drawing mm. and doing stuff. So, uh, but yeah, um, it seems like a very interesting project. And as I do my video on it, I'm sure I'll find out any weird bugs or issues that I come into with it. Um, I'll definitely talk about those for sure. Cool. Um, yeah, d- I'll definitely pay attention to that video. It looks really awesome. All right. Mm-hmm. So mine, uh, my news link for this week is the system 76 mechanical keyboard. Now I don't, you don't probably don't know this about me, but I am a mechanical keyboard aficionado. I have, let me see if I, so I have this one, I have another one that I use, and there's another one over there, and there's another one over there. So I have, like, I don't know, 15 mechanical keyboards. That's ridiculous. Um, I only use mechanical. As soon as you go mechanical, you can't go yeah, back. Yeah, I, I, 
I, I, I, trying to go like if you just use your laptop or whatever and have to type on those little butterfly keys like oh it's like torture it's like it's like using gnome um <laughs> uh, i'm not letting that go um but anyways no you won't system 76 is a brand that i have um talked a few times before on the show before your time but uh they have really good hardware in terms of like computers and stuff like that, they make really stuff. But we've, I've always said they're like the the Apple of the Linux community. They are very mm-hmm. very expensive, and um, yeah. now they've released a mechanical keyboard. And first of all, the keycaps that they've chosen uh, are ugly. I mean, <laughs> I, I know what they're trying to do there. They're trying to go with like the old school like IBM keyboard aesthetic but then they mm-hmm. placed rgb in the background <laughs> like, <laughs> like those those colors just don't go together okay i mean that's just i mean that's the, the first time i saw it that was the first thing that i that i thought that was before i knew that it cost 290 dollars mm-hmm. now if you know anything about like the custom mechanical keyboard uh community or whatever or you know marketplace you'll know that you can get a custom k- mechanical keyboard granted you have to p- put it together yourself um, mm-hmm. Which is really easy because they don't have hot swappable uh, key, key, uh, key switches and stuff. You can get one for like 150 to 180 dollars, mm-hmm. uh, and that includes the key switches and the the key caps. You know, and that's something that you do yourself. Now, obviously, it's not open source, uh, but you know, it's about a hundred dollars cheaper. Uh, and if you don't want to put one together yourself, you can get uh, you know a pre-built one that's really good for a hundred dollars or hundred and twenty dollars. Uh, the one I just got uh, is an IQ Unix L80. It's, it was one hundred and eighty dollars, and this is like top of the line pre-built, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and if I wanted to, I could go through and take out all the key switches and put in my own because it's hot swappable. Uh, mm-hmm. Now the Papa West one is also hot swappable, which is good. Uh, but again, two hundred and eighty dollars. So the question I have is. Is the fact that the hardware and software is open source justify the fact that it's at least a hundred dollars more expensive uh, than uh, similar boards? What do you think? I don't think so. I mean, I've I've actually done a whole video on System Seventy Six and their hardware being just too pricey. Um, but so the keyboard that I'm using right now, this is the uh, Logitech TKL. Um, it's wireless slim um i believe these are like brown switches um i only bought it because i i end up taking like my keyboard with me everywhere because a lot of my friends just don't use mechanical keyboards and i i hate i hate a big keyboard that's those spongy keys i cannot stand that whatsoever so i end up taking it with me and i like something slim this thing is $220. And the only reason it's that much is because it's slim mechanical keyboards and it, it or switches and it's wireless. It also comes with a whole bunch of extra buttons and stuff. I I don't need them, but still, I would not pay a $100 premium for essentially not a, a Keychron keyboard. Like if you think about it, the the keyboard's aesthetics, it's very close to a key keychron and you could pick up the same you know form factor keyboard here for 60 bucks on amazon well, yeah, I mean, keychron. even if you went with the keychron that was hot swappable and stuff that's a hundred dollars right and that comes with you know mm-hmm. everything you need uh, but like i said it's not open source so i mean my view on the whole open source thing is that i don't care about the hardware I mean, who cares if the hardware is open source i'm uh, I don't, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I can't get in there and start looking at the, the PCB and, you know, whatever. Uh, the software, the fact that that's open source is great. And I understand that it costs money. Now, I don't care that there's a premium on this. I think $200 would have been a, a great price. Uh, it would have been, I think it would too. you know, maybe it's about $50 more than really what it's would be worth if it wasn't open source. That extra $50 is a great premium for whatever. $300 is, is, is just too expensive. I mean, I, you go on and on about the price because the price is really the thing that, uh, you know, caught my eye and made me say, well, you know, this is, uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, but I mean, there's, uh, the, the problem is, is that especially in the 65% keyboard market or whatever, there are just so many options. You know, mm-hmm. in terms of com- 
and, and they're really good. I mean, it's not as if like uh, we're talking. I mean, you you mentioned the Keychron at sixty dollars. There's a ton and ton of like sixty five percent keyboards between sixty five and eighty dollars. I mean, there's like hundreds of them. Go to Amazon and search for them. You got like every Chinese brand you can imagine has some. Uh, you know, Razer has one. Uh, there's the Ann Pro. There's all. You know, there's all these ones, right? And they're all less than a hundred dollars. There's just this is the reason why open source hardware never works is because they have to chart. I mean, I understand that they they can't do the whole mass production thing that other companies can do. So that's going to be more expensive. I understand it. It just they always take the more expensive part and then just push it way out of the park in terms of just you can't justify three hundred dollars for a keyboard because at three hundred dollars you can get a whole kit and get like top of the line. Now, obviously you can spend way more than $300 if you're going to, you know, mm-hmm. get crazy switches and, uh, you know, crazy form factors and stuff like that. But at $300, you're at the, you're like at, right at the point where you can build an actual keyboard for that. And no, I mean, like, let's be honest at $300, you're pretty darn close to like moon lander or ergo docs, easy like land. Mm-hmm. I, I, I can't justify a, uh, a, a small keyboard well, I mean, with limited at three hundred dollars, you're getting very close to computer price, right? I mean, you, you can almost buy it. <laughs> well, when I, you put I, it like that, I mean, you, I mean, you at five hundred dollars, you can get a computer, right? So you're two hundred dollars away from actually buying a computer. Now, and this, and this is just a keyboard, right? I mean, if, and if you look at it, you can buy a, that Raspberry Pi four hundred or whatever for like a hundred bucks. That is a computer. Now yeah. it's, a, it's a crappy keyboard. Now if this had a Raspberry Pi in it for three hundred dollars, that'd be cool, right? That 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 would be much more interesting because Hell, be, e- even an Arduino or something, yeah, yeah just anything. It'd be cool. Right? I mean, that that'd be really neat because then it would give it something that makes it more than just something that is you can buy for one hundred fifty bucks. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I think that's our thoughts on the System Seventy Six thing. Um, it's disappointing because uh, when they first said that they were going to do this, like, well, you know what? That's really kind of cool. But uh, there was always that niggling back in the back of my mind, like, well, this is System Seventy Six. You know, they're going to charge. You know, if if System Seventy Six made wheels, they'd be the exact same price as the Mac Pro wheels. <laughs> yes, they would. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, <laughs> They're the Apple, the, the Linux community. That's and it, you know, whatever. What, what's mostly disappointing about it is that System76 seems to be the only vendor here in the States that we can actually get this kind of hardware from. Now, you can talk mm-hmm. about Dell and IBM or whatever, but they're, I mean, if you want to buy an Ubuntu based Dell laptop, good luck finding it on their website. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they no. bury that thing like they don't, they're, they're ashamed of it. Uh, so, Even their technicians, if you were to call them up, I'm pretty sure they'd they'd be like, "What? Um, <laughs> sure, I'll ask my manager if we have it, but right. no." <laughs> um. <laughs> anyways, uh, what was I gonna say? Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the main topic. What is the main topic this week, Tyler? Ah, uh, the main topic is so um, does. Does Google actually care about Linux security? Um, at least they talk like they do. Um, I don't know if uh, you saw the link that I put in here, but it's um, um, about Google funding uh, some Linux kernel developers um, full time to just maintain and uh, focus on the actual like Linux kernel security um, and continue the development. So uh, apparently the two the two um, full time maintainers um, that they've um, funded is Gustavo Silva and Nathan Chancellor. Um, and I just wanted to talk about this. Do you, I I find it good, but very. I'm very wary of the fact that Google is actually funding and making it seem as if they do care a ton about Linux security. And they, for their own purposes, they do care about Linux security. Um, and I think that's sort of a problem. Um, I, I don't know. How do you feel about Google funding um, full-time maintainers for security? It doesn't surprise me at all because they... If you look at the biggest contributors to Linux kernel, actually, one of them is Google. So, mm-hmm. and that's been that way for quite some time. So, it's not that 
I think that they probably do care about Linux security. The, the real question is, do they care about it because of Linux security or because they use Linux? And I think mm-hmm. that that's the, the where it goes. They're, they're doing it for selfish reasons and, you know, whatever. I mean, that's okay. As long as yeah. we benefit from it, who cares what their motivations are behind it? Um I don't think that this is something that will happen for very long because eventually they're going to ditch the Linux kernel. Um, mm-hmm. But, I mean, if if you look on your phone and look and see what Linux kernel you're using on your phone, you'll probably find that it's probably 4.14 or one earlier than that. There's a ton. If you look, there's a ton of 3. Dot stuff out there in terms of Android oh, phones because really? they just don't get updated at all. Like if you buy oh, a, true, if yeah. you buy like a $40 phone from, uh, you know, your local Kroger, uh, <laughs> and, and it's made by ZTE, that thing is never, ever, ever going to get an update. Um, and it's, pr- you know, maybe it starts out like with Android nine or 10 or whatever. And you're maybe using like 4.14 or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> but you're never going to get an update to that. So, um, I think that they're, they're really focused on the top tier Android stuff. Um, which is unsurprising because that's where they make their money, right? So. Yeah. Well, I, I think what what sort of puts me off about Google being um, so uh, willing to ca- put in cash towards security on Linux is uh, it, it makes me worry that eventually the Linux community will get to the point where we're so used to having full-time maintainers and stuff that we just won't be able to handle it when Google leaves and those full-time maintainers are no longer getting paid consistently or at all to put in as much work as they do. I think that's what worries me about it, uh, is maybe it'll change the way we treat security on Linux. I think maybe... Uh, it's possible that that happens, but I don't see that the Linux community at, at large doing that, mainly because I don't think that the Linux community and in general, the specific like kernel maintainers are ever going to give up enough control to Google to have that happen. Um, now, that being said, there are organizations in the Linux community, in the FOSS community, uh, that are much more uh, buddy-buddy with Google than the Linux kernel maintainers are. So for the like the the Linux Foundation, uh, obviously Google sits on that board, right? So they're very close together. Um, but also Canonical, right? I mean, Canonical and Google work together a lot. Canonical and Microsoft work together a lot. And now I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing, but I also think that it's something that you have to be a little bit wary of because you know that uh, unlike Canonical, unlike OpenSUSE, you know those company Microsoft and Google are very much companies that are uh, they need to make a profit, right? At the end of the day, that's what their their entire goal. They their goal isn't to forward FOSS software. Their goal is to make money for their shareholders. So uh, you, well, like I said, like I don't think that like those com- companies and organizations working together is a bad thing. It's just something that you have to be. Uh, vigilant about and always kind of think about in the back of your mind and just you know not necessarily something we have to worry about it's just something that you know you have to understand that sometimes the motivations especially like i mean to go back to the main topic we i talked about you know when i first started was that i don't think that google contributing this to the to the kernel linux security is a bad thing uh you just kind of have to keep in mind their uh, reasons for doing it, right? So yeah. um, that's the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. I, I I don't know. I just, what what makes me nervous is what happens when we have enough corporate backing or enough corporate um, positions in the Linux space for maintaining the actual Linux kernel to where there's no incentive to maintain any portion of the Linux kernel without, you know, getting a job for it. Um, if there's enough jobs in maintaining the Linux kernel, um, and it gets to be that way for quite a while, like let's say even a decade, um, I, I, what, what makes me nervous about that is it might, it might 
make the people willing to maintain the Linux software or Linux kernel unwilling without being paid to do it, if you get what I'm saying. Um, that's what just makes me nervous about it. But yeah, I can see it, that. I, that. That's also probably just a conspiracy nut sort of idea. It's really, I don't say that's likely. It just, I don't know. That's why I'm wary about so many jobs coming into actually maintaining Linux uh, itself. I think it's a great thing, um, but I, it also makes me wary. So, yeah. Well, I mean, because, I mean, obviously, we, the more people who get paid to do it, the more people who would want it. But, all right. <laughs> exactly. Um, the question you have to ask is then, would those jobs go away? But I don't, I think, even if, like, f for what exa even if we lose companies along the line, let's just say Google eventually decides they don't care about, first of all, Google, stop listening to me, you bastard. <laughs> um, dumbass phone. Um, <laughs> even if we lose uh, the Google, you know, you know, along the way, I don't think we'll ever see all of the jobs that this creates go away, right? Because Linux, and we always kind of fear that like one day we're going to wake up and Linux is going to go away or because, mm -hmm. you know, not be what it always is. And I don't think that that's ever going to be the case. Um, I, I have a hard time seeing uh, Linux ever becoming at least in terms of what the important parts of Linux. So, like, like we all know that the desktop Linux is unimportant. Nobody cares about that. I could see the desktop mm -hmm. Linux going away someday or becoming so marginalized it's just a community-maintained project. Like, mm -hmm. I could see someday Canonical saying, you want, we're not going to do desktop Ubuntu anymore. I could see yeah. it. I don't think it's going to happen, but, I, you know, I can imagine that happening. Uh, but yeah. the important parts of Linux which is the parts that make money in terms of like servers and stuff like that. That stuff here is going to stay, it's going to stay open source, I believe uh, probably forever because I think that it benefits too many corporations that share the code. Right. Um, mm -hmm. The, the part that the biggest thing we have to worry about as a Linux community isn't necessarily the corporate influence, which is, you know, it is worrying uh, but the biggest thing we have to worry about is actually bringing in new, fresh, young developers. Because right now we have uh, very, how do I put this, um, senior development. <laughs> They're, the, the people who developed the Linux kernel have been doing it for a very long time. And eventually yeah. Linus Torvalds and all those guys... They're going to retire. <laughs> like mm -hmm. We need somebody, whether they're getting paid or not, to, t to take to be able to be his protege or whatever and take over for him when he decides to eventually, you know, go spend his money or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, um, you know, cause eventually I think that's going to be the, the, the biggest, uh, the, the biggest thing we have to do as a community over the next 15 to 20 years is replace the, the OGs, right? You know, the the, the, mm -hmm. the the people who started Linux that are eventually going to age out of the system. I mean, when obviously, yeah. <laughs> I'm saying, well, well, I'm killing Linus Torvalds <laughs> off, but, um, <laughs> you know, eventually he's going to, like I said, he's going to yeah. retire and all these guys that work with him have been with him since the beginning, basically. And that was like the 19, like the mid 1980s. So it's, it's been 35, 36 years, you know? So mm -hmm. it's been a long time. And it, like eventually he's going to retire, so we need the fresh blood. And uh, what we really would be really great is to see like a, whole, a benefit from this whole Google thing of them bringing in uh, developers or whatever. Because if they can bring in developers and pay them, and then get those developers interested in open source, those developers may eventually go on when they leave Google. Because people leave tech companies all the time to move around, right? Maybe mm -hmm. eventually they go work at a Mozilla or they go to work for the Linux Foundation and develop the kernel or whatever. Um, maybe this brings in some fresh uh, developers. That'd be yeah. uh, one positive way of looking at it, right? Yeah, I think I think you're definitely right, yeah. Well, I mean, hope, we can hope I'm right. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's also possible we could look at it completely the other way around around and say this yeah, is the yeah. doom of the Linux kernel and everything is going to be terrible and we're all going to be using Chrome OS in a year and it's going to be just horrible. God. You know the only thing worse than GNOME? Chrome OS. Chrome OS. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Chrome OS. Now, I, I don't know if this is true. Do you, do you know if it's true that 
Chrome OS is based on Gentoo. Is that true? Uh, that is true. Yes. Why, if they were going to base it on, on a Linux uh, base, why would they base it on Gentoo? That's just, like, come on, man. Arch, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> I got a cough. I have no idea why they went with Gentoo, it's, but there has I mean there has to be some technological reason why they went with Gentoo. Um I mean obviously Chrome OS is so far removed from its Gentoo base that it probably doesn't matter what they built on. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. Uh, but it's weird that they built it on a Linux distro at all instead of just building it on a kernel like they did with Android. <laughs> well, I mean, it's amazing to even think that it's based on Linux because I, I don't know. Have you seen the steps it takes to get Linux running on a Chromebook? It takes, yeah. Well, not, I mean, base wise, I've seen some of the like the stories behind it, but even just using the apps within Chrome OS, at least for a long time there, was actually quite uh, burdensome. <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. a lot, it's apparently a lot easier now, but um, still. yeah, it's, it's a pain. Yeah. Okay. Let's go ahead and um, move on to the apps of the week. So, let's. Uh, why don't you go ahead and talk about your app of the week? So, my app of the week is called Dust 3D, and it's this really neat and um, simple 3D um, modeling software. Um, I'm definitely going to be exploring it some more. Um, it's completely free and open source and it's not meant to compete with like blender or anything it, it's com- it's completely different it's meant for just if you want to model something um and you need a, a, either a very simple model or you're not trying to get very advanced with the model you just you just need something as say a good placeholder or something like that um it's really what what this is for or just making simple models very quickly. It's very interesting. And unlike Blender, you can hop in this and know nothing about it and just start messing around for a few minutes and end up with a pretty decent 3D model, even not knowing what you're doing. Um, It's very fun piece of software to mess around with. Cool. Um, I don't know anything about 3D 3D modeling. I'm not... um artistic <laughs> at all like not Same. even a bit so um all right so i can just fake my artistic yeah I, I can't even fake it I, I if you if uh my limitations of art art you know art is probably stick figures and even then uh not good <laughs> so um cool uh so my pick this week is a terminal based application surprise surprise called beats b e e t s and basically what this is is a it's a, it's written in python so if you're anti python i'm sorry about that uh, basically, basically what this is is a media library management system so basically what you'll do is you'll run this in your in your music folder and it will go through an attempt to tag using uh, various methods to tag your music collection so that it organizes them in the proper folders it organizes them with you know artists uh, album and all that kind of stuff um it's not as automatic as the uh the github page makes it seem unfortunately there's quite a bit of stuff that you actually have to add in to it in order for it to actually work uh there's plugins and stuff like that you have to add in order to get access to all the media libraries and stuff that it will actually check um and uh it will actually transcode audio and stuff like that too so it has a ton of different features Mm. if you want to go through and check it out um it's if if you are one of those people who uh back in the early 2000s used nefarious i won't want to say nefarious uh various means of getting your music not so legally uh mm-hmm. limewire uh napster before it turned you know nap you know legal uh <laughs> whatever uh, if you're one of those people and just downloaded just tons and tons of music and whatever your library is probably a mess and uh, mm-hmm. tools like this, it would be definitely be something that you could look into to help you organize your music library uh, it, it, for the first time. So without actually having to go through and do it, you know, um, manually, which would suck. Mm-hmm. So that's Beats. Uh, and I, links for both of these 
and the news items will be in the show notes, whether you're watching this on YouTube or through a podcast catcher. Uh, so you can get all the links and stuff like that to these things in the show notes. That's okay. a very nifty little program. I'm definitely going to have to be using this. Yeah, it's cool. Um, it's uh, And it still is being updated. So it's it's been around for a, a long time, but it's but just, you know, there's been commits and stuff to it within the last five days. So it's definitely not been okay. abandoned. So um, I did have a, a few uh, bugs in it, but I don't think that they're bugs necessarily, more just the fact that it is a complicated program. So... Uh, getting it up and running is a little bit of a, you know, a, a task. So make make sure you check out the wiki and stuff like that because it has really good documentation as well. So, uh, anyways, that is okay. beats. All right, so uh, that is it for this week. Uh, coming up next week, we're going to be talking about uh, using pipeware. Is it time for prime time? So, uh, I don't know if you've ever used pipeware or not. Tyler, I have not mm-hmm. either. So this is we have homework uh, oh. between today and next Thursday. We have to install Pipeware on a, it. Doesn't have to be your main system, uh, mm-hmm. uh, whatever, uh, and use it, it's, or at least try to use it. Um, All right, this is going to be fun. <laughs> right. Um, so that is coming up next week, uh, along with the news and the apps and picks of the week. Uh, so uh, we'll be. Before we go, actually, before we go, I should go ahead and um, thank our current patrons, uh, if I can. Uh, Devon Can't Marcus, Maglin, Donnie Sven, Merrick, Campa Mitchell. There's no uh, big video here, so I, I'm kind of half-assing this. But thanks, everybody, for your support. Patreon.com slash LinuxCast if you want to support the channel. And um, thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm. See ya.